Yeah, thank you very much for your for the invitation. And you guys asked me to talk about uh, collaborating on GitHub. And I will talk about like a little bit, a very, very few minutes about GitHub. Most of this talk is actually about Git. Uh, if you understand what Git is and how Git works, GitHub is self-explanatory because all that GitHub is in essence is a hosting service for Git repositories. All right, yeah, so uh, start off with this, with this brief comic here. XKCD, this is Git, it tracks collaborative work. This is what you guys are interested in, right? Through some uh, theory tree model, we don't care about that stuff. And then the lady asks, how do we use it? And the answer is no idea. Most people don't properly know how Git works and how to use it. He says, in, uh, Git is just a bunch of shell commands. You memorize them, you type them in, and then you sync up your work. And if you mess up, you start fresh. This is what, what he explains to do. This is also what... Uh, honestly, it will probably happen to you at some point, but I will try today to give, an, give or communicate the ideas behind Git and why Git exists and what problems it solves. And the problem it does solve are summarized here, all the problems. Uh, I have to shamefully admit this is from my work, a paper I was working on a few years ago. And you see, I have like a version for each date that I thought I should keep a version of, of the current uh, status of the work. I have a different version for one of my collaborators and another one of my collaborators who were working on the manuscript at the same time. And then I somehow had to merge all of these changes that they proposed. And then you end up with a mess like this, right? Where you have a huge mess and you don't actually know what is where, what is what, what changes were made and so on. And to resolve all of this, Git exists. With Git, you track changes to what you do, which can be code, it can be a manuscript, it can be essentially anything you want, uh, but it is somewhat restricted to text files. Uh, and it will track what changes uh, you have made and it allows, we will see that later, to work collaboratively on the same thing at the same time and not, not mess up each other's stuff. Yeah, so this is the three topics I want to cover today. First is the basics, like the very basics. How does Git work? And there we will also see that actually Git is just a bunch of shell commands. And we will go through, through a few to see how would you use Git if all you wanted to do is track your changes locally and you're the only one working on your stuff. This you can do with just the basics. Then I will talk a little bit about branching, why branching may be useful and that you essentially have then two or multiple uh, parallel development ways in your code and you can merge them later on. And then what is then most relevant if you try to collaborate is how to actually interact with a remote repository that is hosted somewhere, for example, on GitHub, but can be any other service as well. So basics first. When we start, we start with a working directory which is wherever you have your code located, right? In this case, I now have screenshots of my terminal, right? So at some directory, I created a little demo to show today. Uh, and if we just have a look what is in the demo, you see there's just a single file here, it's a readme. And now for whatever reason, we want to, or decided to, that we want to keep track of the changes we do to the readme, right? For a readme, this may be not too useful, but if it's like code that you're using for your research and also eventually maybe want to publish with your research, this can be uh, quite useful to keep track of, of what you're actually doing. And then all we do is to start tracking uh, what happens in this to this file is we type git init. And here on the left, I will always uh, list the commands that we use. In the beginning, we actually go through the terminal and uh, uh, see, see the commands being used. Later on, I will just talk about the ideas that they do or that they represent. But when we just type git init, we get some feedback. We initialized an empty git repository. So we now have the working directory and we do have a repository, which is empty for the moment. And this was or created in .git. If we again check what is now in the folder, it created a folder sub subfolder in our folder dot git we don't 
care actually about how .git works internally. For us, it really only matters how we use it. But in .git, you can check out all the details, how all the all the workings work. Everything is stored in this .git. And if, for example, for whatever reason, you decide you no longer want to keep track of changes and you want to actually remove all the history, you just remove this folder and is, it is as if Git was never there. Now, if we check the status of our current repository via Git status, we get a bunch of information already. Right? So we type in Git status and we get some information, information on what branch we are. We will talk later what branches are. We are in this case on main. This used to be master, but uh, the naming has been has been changed in the community to main, uh, like only a year ago or something. It tells us that there are no commits yet. We will see what a commit is. It tells us, or it recognizes that there is an untracked file, so it notices there is a file that the repository is not yet aware of, and it tells us how do we start keeping track of that file. Uh, and then a summary, essentially, nothing added to commit. So no commits yet, but unchecked files are present. And then again, git add to edit. In my terminal, I have a setup that I immediately in the command line get some feedback on the status of my repository. So I have behind the folder name, I have main is the branch I'm on. And then the question mark one means there's one untracked file that git doesn't or is not yet aware of. Essentially, right? And then we just essentially follow what Git tells us to do, right? It tells us to keep start tracking the file. We should add it. And if we do exactly that, we are Git add and then the file name, or if you type a dot, it adds all files that have changes or have been added. Uh, this gets moved first to the staging area. And this is important to know that this exists because that may confuse you otherwise if you are not aware that if you add a file, it's not immediately moved to the repository. There's like an intermediate step, and we will talk about why that exists. And now I also got the feedback in my terminal that the plus one means, so now there is a, a new change in the staging area that is ready to be committed to the repository. And yeah, talked about commit and committing a bunch already. What is git commit? The command for git commit is commit. Uh, and this means, in essence, we move the changes we have in our staging area from the staging area to the repository. And then finally, the repository is actually in sync with the working directory. So if we go through what I have typed here, right, with git status, we now see that changes are to be committed. So at that point, the changes have only been uh, in the staging area. And then if we type git commit, and we should give it a message like some kind of information of what this commit is about, which for the first commit often is first or initial commit. For later commits, you should, like in a few words, describe what you're doing here. For example, fix, bug, whatever, or add feature, whatever, so that you later on know when months or years later you look at your history, because maybe you made a mistake at some point, uh, you know where to look and what you did when. And now in my terminal view, uh, after this, there's actually no more indication for any, any file because what we have in the working directory, so the files that we see are exactly what the repository expects the file should be. So the working directory and the repository are now in sync. Which we see again, if we type git status, nothing to commit, working tree clean. Working tree means essentially the working directory is clean. So at this point, we have now added the file to the repository. They are both in sync. And now we start making changes. I did it like this, right? It can be that you edited the file in your code editor or wherever. I just added a new line into the readme file via echo. And then if I again check the status, it now tells me that uh, there are changes. Previously, it told us there's a new file that is untracked. Now it knows, okay, in this file that I should track, there are changes uh, that have not been staged. So they're not yet on this in the staging area. Uh, and it again tells us uh, with add to move it to the staging area or with restore to undo the changes we did to restore the state that is saved in the repository. 
It also tells us that we can use git commit dash a immediately, which essentially skips the staging area, where we go directly from what changes we made in the working directory immediately to the repository, which often is fine, right? Often that's perfectly enough uh, for what you need to do. But, and I will get to that in a second, staging area can be useful. There's a command git diff, which can become really useful. Uh, with git diff, you check what is the difference between what your working directory and repository are. If you type that in, you get a new view that looks like this, where you have a bunch of essentially meta information so you know what you're looking at. And you're looking at the differences between these two files at these two states. And then in here, there's some syntax that is specific to Git, so Git knows how to pass this information. And here I have a plus, which means this line was added since I last uh, created this file. And so this, with this, I can briefly check what are the changes in here. And if we then commit, like uh, they suggested, with skipping the staging area, so with an immediate dash A, which means all changes, commit them. And again, we uh, put some message. We now have them again in sync with the working directory and the repositories showing the same thing. Now the staging area does exist in essence only for one use case, where if you make a bunch of changes, because you are, I don't know, have been working all day long, but you don't want to commit every time you make a change, you don't actually want to keep track of everything is single change, and you ended up making, making a bunch of changes that have different context. Like one change you made was fixing a bug. A different change you made was cleaning up your syntax. A different change you made was updating the readme. And so you don't have to bunch all of them together and commit them into the repository, which if you then later on check your history, shows up essentially as, as one, one big change, which can be harder to look through and also harder to revert if you make a change somewhere that is a mistake uh, in the end. For that, the staging area exists where you can then select the specific changes you made, uh, move them to the staging area, commit them, and then the other ones keep are still remaining and you can do that step by step. That's why the staging area exists. I would say for almost everything you do, at least as long as you're working on your own personal code by yourself, this uh, does not matter, matter too much. But as soon as uh, you start reading your repository again, maybe a few years later, and you don't remember at all what you were doing, or somebody else joins your project and has to figure out, maybe they find a bug and they have to figure out when was this file last changed, uh, then having this like granular keeping track of the changes on a granular level, then this can be really useful. Right? And this is what I would call the basics of Git. This is all you need to know to keep track of the changes you make and to have a complete history of, of the changes. Uh, one thing that is very important with Git and why Git is so advantageous is uh, that it does only keep track of changes. So there, there's a full history of every single commit you have made and every single commit re represents only the changes that were made. You don't create a new copy of the entire code base, like for example, in the predecessor SVN, this does create a new copy of the entire code base every time. And this was then replaced already, or should have been replaced by all uh, many years ago by Git, where you only keep track of changes. But Git is so widespread, not because of this functionality, right? That you can for yourself keep track of changes and revert changes, which is really useful, but that's not the reason why it has come become so dominant. Uh, the reason for that are these more advanced concepts, which is branching and remote. First, we talk about branching. So if we go back to the same idea we had before that I with this sketch uh, put up here, right? So we have this workflow of a working directory where we put changes in the staging area, we commit them, and then we do that again uh, and again and again, right? And every time we do it, we essentially create a new state of the repository. So here we had a state of the repository at one time, and then the yellow arrow represents a commit 
so a change to the repository, then we get a new state, and if we do it again, a new state, and so on and so on. And over time, we get a history of all the changes we have made to, to our, our code. And we can check this history with git log. If you type git log, you get a view like this, uh, where at the bottom, this was the first commit we made. You get some information what the identifier of that commit is, who did it, at what time, and how, what the message was that, that you typed in, and then a history of all the things that happened. Here's one additional one, because I, I threw that out because of, because of time. But in the git log, you get a full history of everything that has happened in your repository. And now let's say we are in this situation, right? We are developing some code. Uh, and maybe this one was when we first initialized the repository and then we added some files and then we made some changes. And we now decide that this version of the code should be or should stay the same as long as we're working on something else, right? So maybe you want to implement a new processing feature in your whatever code where you're not yet quite sure whether it will actually end up being a part of your code, where you're just experimenting uh, with some ideas and trying some stuff, and you don't yet know whether this will actually uh, yeah, be remain in your code for the future. This is one use case where branching can be useful, where you create a branch. Uh, and here I list two commands. Git branch allows you to manage branches, where you can delete branches and create branches. And with Git checkout, you can switch what you see in your working directory between the two branches, or however many branches you have. Git checkout is also the command to go back to previous commits within one branch, for example. So let's say you want to uh, develop some feature uh, and uh, do that again over time. So you start out with some ideas, then you make some changes to your ideas, you find some error, you fix that error, and you get multiple states uh, of your repository. And at some point are happy that with what you have done and now would like to bring the two branches back together that in your main code uh, branch, you still, or you have all the changes that you made. But in the meantime, maybe somebody else was working on, on your main code, right? So maybe you work in a group, you were branching out to create a feature, you created that feature, but in the meantime, somebody else was fixing some minor bugs somewhere in your code or something, right? And then you have two different ways your code base goes, essentially. And to bring them back together, you use the command merge which then allows you to bring in all the changes that, ha that have happened here, bring them back to the main repository and make it one again, essentially. And when you see these kinds of uh, diagrams, they don't look complicated like this, right? But when you Google for Git branch, you will see images like this. Or if you would use uh, some uh, some uh, editor that allows you to manage Git. You will see something like this, uh, where every step here is one state of the repository. The arrows, the yellow arrows represent changes, meaning there were committed changes to the repository. And here you then branch out, you do something, and then you merge back into the main branch. And you can then right, make changes. They don't have to be at the same time. Uh, in a moment, we will discuss what happens if changes have been made to the same file, but these we will we'll see in a bit. So this is why this feature thing may be useful. And you, you will, for example, see that the people that develop OpsPy usually uh, create a branch for a feature that they develop. And if they are happy with the feature, they then merge the branch back into the main, uh, into the main repository. But you may also want to use branches Again, if you develop code that you want to make available to people to keep like versions that you think are stable uh, and represent meaningful steps that you should maybe would label them as versions or something, right? Could, for example, say at this state here, uh, this whatever this was, 
uh, with this at this stage, we were so happy with the code that we call this version 1.0. And then we create a release branch. And then all we do to the release branch is actually whenever we're happy again or think our code represents a new meaningful version that we merge into the release branch again and maybe call it version 2.0 or whatever. So this is what branching is about. It's really about uh, making it easy to develop features on the site uh, and also to have uh, releases uh, like or have stable states like this. So everything I've talked about so far, you can do just locally on your own if you're the only person that, that works on your code, right? How do we interact with code that is hosted somewhere, for example, at GitHub? How do we make sure that we stay in sync? What do we do if it's not, uh, and, and so on. So let's say our repository is hosted at GitHub. Uh, we call this the remote location. We label it green. And this is the current state. Maybe some initial commit and maybe one commit has been done to change what uh, the initial state was. Right? Whatever this exactly is doesn't matter. What we do need, so this is now from the perspective of you want to contribute to someone else's code, right? Maybe one of you works on code, you have it on a GitHub repository and you either have it public or private and you give access to the person you want to work with. And then that person somehow needs to get a copy of your repository uh, and then work, work essentially in parallel on the same code. Uh, so there's now, we now need to create a local copy, which we somewhere have in our file system, doesn't, doesn't matter where. And just copy whatever the state was over to our local system. And in Git, uh, that command is not called copy for reasons, I guess, it's called clone. With the clone command, we get a local copy uh, of the remote repository and we now have the same repository in two spaces once on the GitHub server and once in our system, on our system. And this you can have with as many people as you want, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, and with the clone, we get the uh, repository, which means we get the entire history of the repository as well. Because what a repository is, it just keeps track of changes that have been made to what we have done. So we cannot just say we copy uh, the latest state then we would only copy the latest changes. That doesn't make any sense. We need the entire context of what has happened, which means you copy actually the entire repository and the full history, and you can go back uh, all those years that have been, have been developed before. And now let's imagine a situation. This code lies somewhere online. We are locally, and at some point, we maybe want to make changes to this local version of the repository. But in the meantime, somebody else was working remotely and updated the uh, remote repository. So this is now in a new state. There have been, there was another commit uh, to the repository and we now need to make somehow sure uh, that we are still on the latest version, ideally, right? In practice, that will not always work, but ideally before we start making changes, we are on the exact same version uh, that the online uh, version is at, and there's a command for that that is called pull. Right? Uh, with pull, does like in if one is precise, it actually does two things. But for our purposes, that doesn't matter too much. It fetches the changes and it also integrates the changes into our local version in, of of the repository. And then we are st again in sync. And then we could, for example, make changes to the repository and push is the word for that, them to the remote location. And then the remote location would be aware of what we have done. And in this way, everything is always perfectly in sync, which is why it's a good idea and why many code editors by default, uh, whenever you, for example, open it uh, and you start working again, it, they, uh, pull all changes automatically and ask you if you want to implement them and inform you about what they are. Or that, for example, whenever you, uh, that, that you do 
like whenever you make changes, you do a pull and a push immediately. So you make your, you pull, you commit, you, well, when you, when you submit your commit into your local repository, you pull first, you commit, and then you push immediately into the remote location. A lot of code editors do this like automatically. Uh, these, these several steps to make as, as good as they can sure that it's, everything is in sync because it can get ugly if it's not in sync. Uh, one important thing, very important thing here is push means that you have the rights to actually change what the remote repository is, which is not always the case, right? Let's say we wanted to, or we, we clone the OpsPy repository. We think we can do their whatever merging function better than they do. Uh, and then we make changes and then we would like them to be aware of the changes we've made and implement them, right? But we cannot just push the changes, right? They have the control over what OpsPy looks like. So push only works if you have the right to push. There are several ways, and for that I would suggest to read the GitHub uh, instructions, right? There are several ways to make sure that, or to identify yourself through SSH keys or whatever, uh, that GitHub actually knows you're the right person. If you don't have the rights to write to remote, what you do, uh, what you do is uh, you request the remote repository to pull the changes from you, which is why this command is called request pull. I personally always found it unintuitive. I always thought this should be called request push because I request the right to push but for reasons that I'm not aware of. Uh, in Git, this is called request pull, which means the rem you request from the remote repository that they pull the changes from you. And this is a term you, for example, find at the very top of your GitHub page, request pull, to handle these kinds of, kinds of problems. So this is what you do if you have not, don't have the rights to change the repository. Right. So far, first in branching, but also here with remote. And it's important to emphasize that these are different things. In branching, we worked on branching, uh, yeah, on branches of the repository. In this case, which I try to uh, show by ha all having the same background and the main being in the center, this is all in the same branch. It's just different copies of the same repository uh, working on the same branch. And so far, we have done everything perfectly in sync, that we were aware of changes that have been done elsewhere, and elsewhere was made aware of changes that we have done. Right? What happens if that's not the case? Let's say we clone uh, and we make some change, and here I put this number to identify that this is some commit that changes some files. Uh, and then on the remote location, also some commit has been made that changed the same file that we were working on. And when you then try to, in branching, you would call mer that merging, essentially. Uh, here you would call that pushing. If you try to uh, uh, bring those two changes together, uh, you can run into what is called a merge conflict. A merge conflict essentially means uh, there are several changes to one file. For example, uh, your project is poorly organized and two people were working actually on the same function and made some changes and now you try to merge it, but uh, you somehow need to figure out what is what. Or this also happens simply if in the same file people, someone works at a function that is defined at the very top and someone else is defined at the function at the very bottom. There are like trivial cases to resolve where it's clear, okay, they actually meant different things. Uh, but that's not always the case. It can happen that uh, you run into the situation where somebody, which is whoever is in charge of the remote version of the repository, uh, somebody needs to decide which parts of which commit to keep, how to resolve this conflict, which can also mean having to write entirely new code, essentially. How do you handle this situation? Right? This is uh, when merge conflicts arise. And for this, you then have on GitHub and whatever else exists, some nice tools to handle this stuff. Right, so 
these were the main important concepts I wanted to explain, right? So the basics of Git, branching, and how to interact with remote uh, copies, essentially, of your repository. And I have always, uh, in the beginning, I've also shown you in the terminal the commands here. I have then listed what the commands are. In practice, you most likely don't have to actually uh, write many of these commands because in all modern code editors, you have Git functionality built right in. Here is an example of what this looks like for me. I know it's, it's quite busy, right? I use uh, Visual Studio Code and this is uh, some, some code I was working on. Uh, and you see, for example, the large view here in the center, this is essentially Git diff. So it shows me what was the old version, what is the new version, and then it highlights what were the changes made. So I can check what is actually, uh, what are the changes here in, in this thing. Here under commits on the left, there is a list of all the previous commits in that project, which is essentially git log. It just tells me what are the commits and then I can click on it and explore it some more, which is way more convenient than trying to do that via the, via the terminal. Here uh, under changes, this is more or less git status. It tells me that these are the files that have been changed. Up here, there's a text box where I can enter a message and then submit to commit. So everything that you do with Git, uh, you can do in your code editor. And this is in in this in VS Code, this is built in. In all the JetBrains uh, editors, it's in like PyCharm or whatever you use. Uh, there are software that do nothing but handle Git, like Source Tree or Git Tower that do nothing else but simply give you all this functionality with a nice uh, interface, like branching and merging and request pull and, and whatever. But um, I think it's way more important to understand what these things mean and how these concepts work. Then you are less likely to run into very ugly issues, uh, issues later on. And I know I'm already a few minutes over, but just the very last thing, uh, you asked me about to talk about GitHub, so I thought I will talk about GitHub. I mentioned in the beginning, GitHub is essentially just a hosting service for all the things we have talked about. And if you go to GitHub, you log in and you click on create a new repository. This is the page you see, uh, where you just give it some name, you select if you want to have a public or private, and then you can handle some uh, special files. But let's say we don't create any of them and just create an empty repository on GitHub. The next page, the very next page you see is this, which on top is just the, the Git URL if you know what you're doing. But even if you don't know what you're doing, they tell you what to enter in your terminal, essentially. right? If you want to create a new repository, so you have some code that you have not yet created a repository for, they tell you, okay, the first thing you do is you git in it. Then you add the files you want to keep track of, you commit them, so you move them to the staging area, you move them to the repository, you make sure that you're on the branch main. Then a command that we have not seen, but this is here we tell Git where the remote location actually is. And then we push it to the lo remote location. All of these things, I hope at least after this presentation, you know what they mean and what they do. And this is how GitHub talks to you, right? On GitHub you then see, so mostly GitHub is really just hosting uh, and having a remote version where people can sync up to and so on. But you see that uh, the third tab already in GitHub is pull requests, which is really just a nice interface on the web page to handle if somebody sends you a pull request. There are other web pages, right? This is uh, GitLab and there's Bitbucket and so on and so on and so on. There are many, many services that all essentially do the same thing they host Git repositories for you. And this is this process on GitLab, same two pages essentially. One where you create a repository and one where it tells you what to do with your empty repository. This is why I spend so few minutes now on GitHub and GitLab, because really it's the, the important thing to know is, is Git. And then, of course, there are convenient functions like linking between issues and pull requests and changes. And it's all nice if you know how exactly that works, but that's, I would say, the detailed stuff that is not too important. <laughs>
yeah, so to summarize, this is what we have seen. We have talked about the basics. How do you actually keep track of changes? What does it mean to keep track of changes with Git? How does branching work? When would you maybe want to consider branching? And how do you interact with a remote repository? And there is really not much more to Git. And there are many commands in Git that all, I mean, that's a bit mean to say maybe, but that all exist to handle problems. If you somehow messed up your repository for whatever reason, there's then things to make sure that everything can be aligned again. And that then goes back to the initial comic that if you're entirely lost, uh, you just start fresh, which hopefully never happens to you. You can find the slides on our, on our GitHub. And yeah, I have recorded this again, so I will upload that at some point to the spin channel if you want to have a look.